Hello everyone and welcome to another LSA CPD. Today uh, we have Peter Morris, the Managing Director at AHMM. Uh, Peter is going to be discussing um, how the practice is able to scale up and grow into the practice today, um, how the structuring was kind of put in place, business development and just kind of the processes that were in place to facilitate um, expansion in size. For those of you who this is their first time uh, coming to a CPD with the LSA, um, I'll give you uh, a little introduction into the format. Um, this, is a, this, this talk or this discussion will last one hour. However, uh, we try to give um, the discussion after equal billing to the talk itself. So the, the talk will last 30 minutes and uh, any discussion or questions will also last for 30 minutes. Um, the way this has usually worked in the past, um, this is now our sixth CPD, um, is that people would put questions into the chat and I can read them out. Or if you're feeling confident, um, you can unmute yourself and uh, un, you know, allow your camera to play and you can ask a question yourself then. But until then, while the talk is going on, feel free to put questions into the chat if you're worried you're gonna forget or something. And I can certainly read them out or introduce you. And so without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Peter Morris. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Jason. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, as Jason's just said, I've been asked to talk today about the growth of HMM over time, um, how we've pursued and developed new work, and how we've adjusted our structure to suit. So I'm going to try and talk for around 30 minutes. Uh, okay, start my video. Is that me? Yep. Yep. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, can you see my screen now? Okay, Jason. Yeah, perfect. And you can hear me okay too. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to aim for that 30 minutes that Jason just said. Um, I have to say that when trying to put this talk together, um, knowing that you're going to be addressing other architects, it does feel like there's a danger of stating the obvious because while we may be around 500 people today at HMM, we've been every size of practice over time, obviously from four in the first place and upwards. And ours has been a, a, lift, a lived experience um, where we've largely worked it out as we've gone along. And I, and I don't think that's uncommon for architectural practice. We're not trained in how to run a business. We're trained in how to be architects. So if I end up telling you things you already know, whether about HMM or indeed about being an architect, please bear with me. But this is our story. I'm going to be talking against these four headings. Um, I'm going to kick off by giving some context to the changing scale of the practice over time and what it has meant to us um, before going on to the other three. So here you can see our first 10 years or so as a startup at practice. You can see the growth in headcount in the red lines at the bottom there. Um, project, Peter, so sorry, can't uh, see what you're sharing at the moment. Oh, um, I can't work out why not. Uh, let me try this one more time. In fact, let's try that. There we go. Perfect. Is that it? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll just go back to this slide briefly, if I can. It's not letting me control the slides. Yes, it is. Okay. So I'm just saying, I'm going to talk against these four headings. Um, and um, the first one is really about um, giving context to the changing scale of the practice over time and what it's meant for us. I'm going to do that by showing some graphs. So, so in this next slide, you can see our first 10 years or so is what I've called a startup practice. Um, there's a, the, the head count is there at the bottom in the red, very low, as you can see. And at that stage, we were a simple partnership, um, just the four of us for the first seven years, actually, in practice. And we had no clients when we set up, no private income, and no friends with money to spend. And what all of that in what turned out to be um, a lengthy recession in the early 90s. And we were paying too much rent and foolishly relying on credit cards to see us through, but we retained a high degree of optimism nonetheless, uh, helped along by our various part life partners at the time, because at that stage, we didn't have much else to go on, but our ambition to succeed. So we had several years of scratching around for house extensions, like most of our peers at the time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in fact, in the next slide. And you should recognize some of the names on this poster, uh, which came from an exhibition we created for the RIBA called Under 50K, which was designed to show projects which illustrated to the public, the general public, how good design doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, and of course, that was tailor-made for practices like us who uh, didn't have clients with large amounts of money to spend and were simply looking to, to show our skills in the most public forum we possibly could. 
But of course, we eventually started to receive commissions for real buildings, um, buildings like this one, um, this, a swimming pool and guest house in Wiltshire, which actually had four elevations, which was exciting for us, and which enabled us to start publishing our work because we felt it was good enough, and because also we chose to invest in the best architectural uh, photography we could afford at the time, which in truth we couldn't really afford. But it allowed us to begin to establish a reputation and a profile within uh, the architecture profession and within the wider industry. And so here you see over the following decade, the practice began to grow from its startup condition through to that of an emerging practice with increasingly substantial commissions, um, for a broader range of clients, including institutional clients. And with all that context, you start to be taken more seriously as architects and as a business. And it was during this period that we also chose to become a limited liability partnership with the aim of limiting our exposure as individuals uh, to, to any uh, problems financial or otherwise with the practice and the business. And that was not least because our personal finances remained pretty precarious for much of this period. And of course, towards the end of our second decade in practice in late 2008, uh, global economic forces took over. So regardless of how well or otherwise we were doing, at least for a while, the credit crunch hit many businesses hard, us included. And we started our third decade with a degree of shrinkage, which fortunately for us proved to be relatively short lived, though I have to say painful enough at the time. But in fact, as you can see, our growth then took off to an unexpected and rapid extent and it was the start of this decade that we decided to convert to becoming a limited limited company and that was principally because for the first time we were bringing in enough income not to spend it all as soon as we earned it and so having spare cash in the bank meant uh, by being a limited company it allowed us to be much more efficient in our tax planning and our growth actually continued to the end of last year when as i said earlier we hit around about 500 employees and I share all of this um, not to show off, quite the opposite, but to make a couple of points about growth. Growth in scale, from our perspective, is not important for its own sake and something we have never actively sought, despite the evidence in front of you. In fact, in our minds, uh, it's quite the opposite. We, we've never had a plan to grow, only a plan to make good architecture. But while we fretted about scale at various points over the last 30 years, it became clear to us all at the various stages that organic growth in the way that you see in front of you, if it's growth for the right reasons, is absolutely fine. And as long as you remain in control of the business, something I'll come back to later on. So that's the first point, keeping in control of the business. The second point is it's not that growth is not simply about numbers. It's about much more than numbers. Um, although there's no doubt that increased scale brings benefits such as uh, the opportunity for greater financial stability or the ability to invest in your business with more confidence. Growing up is also about growth in terms of the development of the practice itself, recognising the need to keep pace with the increasingly complex demands which larger scale projects place upon you by bringing increasing professionalism and capability to the practice. So growth is developmental as much as it's numerical. And in terms of our evolution, it was in the last three years, 2017, that we decided to convert to, be, to being a majority owned employee business. So that's the latest phase in our, our, our structural changes, I suppose you could say. And with now 60% of the practice owned by all of its employees and the remaining 40% still held with the founders, but to be gifted to the Employee Ownership Trust once the purchase of the 60% uh, of the shares is complete, which we expect to take around 10 years and we're about three years into that. And for us, part of being, an, and for any EOT, any employee ownership trust, it's important to set out what the core values of the business are, as Ovarup did in his key speech in the 1970s, uh, when they became an employee-owned business, and which is now enshrined in their constitution. And so we wrote our equivalent, what we call the founder statement, to set out what we felt to be those values which underpin the practice and its culture. And I have to say it's a difficult thing to do, even after 30 years and all the perspective which goes with that. But in doing so, it made, us cl it, made it clear to us that, uh, what in many, that, that in many ways, what we'd started off trying to be remained true 30 years later, albeit at very different scales and different levels of development. Uh, and, and this founder statement, as you can see, was set out under three headings, architecture, alliance and ambition. And I'm going to use these headings to talk about our evolution over the past 30 years. 
And even though architecture is what we exist to do, I'm actually going to start with Alliance and how we work. Because the model we set up at university, where the four of us met, still underpins our model of, of practice and working as 500 strong practice now. And it does so across all aspects of our practice. So starting with Alliance, um, when the four of us met at the Bartlett uh, in 1984, we were actually the only non-Bartlett graduates in our year uh, in the diploma, having come from Bristol and Sheffield as two pairs. And so we were naturally drawn together as, uh, uh, as the new boys, uh, all boys as it turns out on the block, and formed a close friendship at an early stage. And in our final year at the Bartlett, our focus moved towards those everyday buildings which form the backdrop to the city. And we devised a group project for the four of us, which saw the development of four office buildings and the public space they defined. And that marked the beginnings of our collaboration. And on the left is an early image showing the master plan we devised for our chosen site in Little Britain, coincidentally just down the road from our office in London today. And while this project was normally about each of us designing a building, it was actually the nature of our collaboration and the process we set up for working alongside each other, a sort of embryonic partnership, if you like, which was, the more in, which was more interesting than the architectural outcome itself. It was a process in which each person took individual responsibility for the design of their own building, but shared a collective responsibility for the public spaces which the four buildings created around and between them. So we developed an iterative process in which each person made their own drawings, exploring the architecture of the, each of the four buildings before coming together for regular meetings when we would collage our drawings together. Do you remember the photocopies in, in plan section and perspective? And that allowed us to understand and discuss the impact of design decisions each of us were beginning to take, both on our own and on each other's buildings. But just as importantly, on the city space, we were collectively beginning to define. And so allowing us to go away and make further iterations in response to what we saw. A kind of honest and explicit negotiation on the basis of visual evidence, leading to an increasingly committed approach to each of the emerging projects and indeed to the shared project being the space in the middle. And this is a process we continue to use today, maybe not literally, but in many ways. And one of the phrases we often use in the practice now is if it's not drawn, it can't be discussed. In other words, you need to commit to something on paper, whether it's drawings, whether it's words, whether it's numbers, for that to be uh, to be provided effectively ev as evidence to allow a, a conversation and a debate to take place. Um, I just managed to lose my place. Bear with me, please. And so, well, we ended up with four building proposals, which was, of course was a prerequisite of achieving our diploma qualifications. It turned out that the process of negotiation uh, around a shared ambition, which had evolved, was the really important bit. Each one of us taking on individual areas of responsibility in pursuit of a collective endeavor. And the purpose for setting this out here is because it's the model now which underpins the working model of practice we set up three years later. So while our early partnership applied to just four people and the design of buildings in the city, it was and remains analogous to how we think about our practice today. Now a very much larger group working within a culture which believes in strong leadership, coupled with an explicit collaborative working method, and one which depends first on each person taking on individual areas of responsibility in pursuit of a collective endeavor. Second, on the mutual respect and interdependence, which this implies. And third, on the understanding that the best ideas will be pursued based on their merits and not on their authorship. This is an approach which we find is equally valid at the individual project level, where we strive to create buildings of quality, and nowadays at the practice level, where we continuously aim to improve how we run the business. And now, how to we have, and now to how we've managed to keep ourselves busy in those 30 years, or indeed get any work at all given that we started a partnership with, as I've already said, without any clients or any portfolio at all to speak of. And so trying to make something from literally nothing, all in the grip of a prolonged recession. And so apart from some income from teaching at the Barlet in our early years of practice, we ended up resorting to advertising our services in the ham and high, the local rag, leading to a range of deeply forgettable projects and briefly seeing an opening in car showrooms, uh, thanks to a school friend of Paul's. Uh, and, and that even led to us setting up a marketing campaign, taking in turns to cold call every Volvo and Porsche dealer in the country. 
but we had very little to show for it and a, a firm resolution never to go down that route again. So instead, we had to find ways of making ourselves visible and at the same time, avoid being pigeonholed by, uh, by becoming one particular kind of practice known for one particular building type. And again, this exhibition, which I referred to earlier at the RIBA, played directly into the zeitgeist with all of those trying to establish practices in the face of recession, along with the prevailing moods actually, that was against any form of contemporary design, uh, encouraged by Prince Charles, you may remember. And indeed where design itself as a word was treated with some suspicion as being a synonym for just expensive. So this exhibition gave us the opportunity to show what we could do, how we could invent an architectural pro project, in this case, a study for an academic on the right in what was otherwise a very simple flat refurbishment, but a means for us to show how we could bring something unexpected to a project and still make it affordable and then present it and display it at the ROBA. And other tactics included inventing expertise where we had none. In this case, another exhibition at the ROBA, which we suggested to them, which was about good design in medical practices. And though we'd never been close to designing a health facility, our connection with this exhibition led directly to a commission for doctor surgery in Croydon, and later on building on that groundwork, being invited to and winning a competition for a new polyclinic in Kendish Town. So the beginnings of developing work in different sectors through different tactics. Other routes to streams of work included working for family and friends, and in doing so, always making the most of the, of, of the opportunity, however limited or modest it might be. And here, I have to say it really was modest, a reading room to enable teachers to observe other teachers working with dyslexic children behind that big green door. But as a result of that project, it gave us a foot in the door of the education sector, and specifically in the Diocese of Brent, where we were invited to design a nursery school, Another one, which then led on to being invited to and then winning a design council composition for a, a competition for a sustainable primary, primary school in Essex. And from there to a project in the Labour's government's uh, academy programme on Harrow Road, which is Westminster Academy on the right. And of course, all of that led to uh, other projects in the school sector, in particular for us, a concerted effort on our part to become involved in the Building Schools for the Future programme, the later version of, uh, of the Labour government's uh, attempt to build new schools that replace the academy programme. And despite the effort of Michael Gove, uh, when he, he and the Tories came into power in 2010 to prevent any of them being built, we went on to complete eight of these projects, in total seven visible here, including Burntwood School on Wandsworth, in Wandsworth, which of course went on to win the Sterling Prize. Collaboration has been another means of entering different sectors of work. Despite our lack of previous experience, in this case, uh, we're in the arts uh, center, uh, arts sector, sorry, we were working with a graphic designer, Morag Myerskoff, who'd been invited to design an exhibition at the Barbican, where we worked with her on the design of the exhibition and installation, and indeed the contents of the exhibition itself, rock style. Uh, and that led to us directly being invited to compete for a major project to refurbish the center's public spaces. And we went on to win that competition and to build it. And indeed, we collaborated with Morag again, bringing her into our project. And that was followed by a number of other projects within the Barbican over the subsequent 15 years. And of course, we continue to work with them uh, on, on projects in the background. And open competitions have also been a way of finding work with new clients. In this case, we're near a competition to design the hoarding for a development off Fenchurch Street by British Land. And that led first to a health centre in one of their developments in Euston, and much, much later to the recently completed one Finsbury Avenue, and next to it, the proposed replacement for number two Broadgate, the neighbour to number one Finsbury Avenue. Now, of course, some of these projects have arrived at a time when our reputation was already well established, for example, in the designs of offices through, through working with other clients. But nonetheless, there is a key point here about finding ways of making yourself known to clients of all types and then keeping in touch with them, even in the long term. And on that note, you can never rule out lucky timing. In our case, when Derwent London bought the offices we'd moved into in Old Street the year before, and we went on to develop a, a very strong working relationship with them, first by re refurbishing our own offices at Morden's in Old Street, before going, uh, growing with Derwent over time through projects like the T Building in Shoreditch, the Angel Building in Islington, and more recently, the white collar factory on Old Street Roundabout. 
And finally in this section is what to do when the odds are stacked up against you and everyone else in terms of finding new business as they were following the credit crunch in 2008. And so we decided then as a practice which was predominantly UK based to look further afield and this in this case to Oklahoma, the home of one of our associate directors. So this is about creating geographic spread as well as sector spread. And, and our Oklahoma office has now grown into a practice of a dozen people working closely with the London team still, and here on a former Bible bindery converted to a family home, along with a range of other projects, big and small, often quirky, quirky, but mainly very different from the opportunities which might present themselves to HMM in the UK context. So a great avenue for different kinds of work. So those are some of the tactics, we, tactics we've used to help build up a body of work across the range of sectors, a range of sectors over the last three decades, always having in mind our view that uh, our expertise is not confined to specific project types, but that our expertise is in architecture and how we apply that across the widest range of projects we can. And this ambition to remain a general rather than a specialist practice relies on building out what we design and in doing so, on, uh, on retaining its, ensuring we retain its quality, the quality of what we build. And so in this final section, I'm going to touch on some of the measures we put in place as a practice, as a practice has evolved to help us to guard the quality of what we produce and so to support our ambition as a practice. And a key moment for me personally in all this was around 15 years ago in 2006, when it became clear to all four of us that we needed to get serious about how we were running the business. As you can see, the, the, the business had already started to grow. We were approaching 100 people by that stage. And the, the administrative and financial control of the practice had always fallen to me and had done so from an early stage, whilst also directing architectural projects. But in 2006, I decided I needed to upskill my amateurish understanding of how to run a business by joining, uh, going on a course, in this case, a business growth program at Cranfield University. Yeah. And despite the name of the course, I actually went to it with the aim of understanding how we might control the growth of our business, because at that stage we were, we were uncertain whether we wanted to continue to grow or not. That was the first reason I went. And the second one was that I, I, was, um, I wanted to understand what the role of a managing partner might be, a role we'd agreed that I should consider taking on more formally. The result of that is, of course, Result of that course, rather, after more than a decade of running the practice, two decades in fact, was both a shock and a wake-up call. A shock because it, came, it became clear to me that the role of managing partner, if I wanted to take it seriously, was pretty much a full-time commitment, and so would take me away from day-to-day -day involvement with architectural projects. And the wake-up call was that if we wanted to take our practice seriously as a business, which we'd always set out to do from the start, even from our modest beginnings, then now was a time to get on with it. And as you can see on the right, the principal outcome from the Cranfield course was not a qualification, but a business plan. And this diagram, which was included in the business plan, aims to summarise the component parts of how a successful architectur architectural practice stays successful. On the left, well-designed and constructed schemes lead to a flow of current projects, then being made visible to existing and potential clients through their publication, entering awards, etc. And so ideally leading to a flow of new commissions. And if it works, then it becomes a virtual, virtuous circle of new projects emerging on the back of the reputation offered by older projects. But clearly this relies very heavily on maintaining the quality of the products that the architecture that you produce through appropriate processes and of course lessons learned. And here you can see how that same diagram can be overlaid with our updated terms since we produced the founder statement and the ones I've been using out throughout today. People and process coming together under heading of alliance, how we work together, and products and profile coming under architecture, what we do and what we produce. And actually, as we've evolved, we've come to consider all of the work which goes on in the practice as having an important bearing on the quality of, of the architecture of the practice, whether directly in support of the projects or more widely in the running of the business itself. And so here you see that the ambition becomes the wrapper which brings all of this together. Our ambition is to produce great architecture, but it is reliant on the quality and clarity of how we run the practice itself and how we support the production of great architecture. 
And so to bring some clarity to this, where we used to avoid differentiation between what each of the directors was responsible for, we've since become clear about our respective roles that we each take on, our individual areas of responsibility within our collective endeavour. So back to that, that piece I said right at the start. And while we still share major decisions between us as the board, um, this setup at the scale we are now is essential to being to, to making better and more informed decisions about all aspects of the practice. And you'll also see in this diagram that I've added in our fifth director member of the board, who is our financial director, Nigel Harris. And moving on and staying with finance, that's in terms of how we, the kind of controls we have in place to ensure the, 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 the business remains uh, buoyant, sustainable, financially st uh, stable, and all of those things. Um, our RFD's role in particular is to, is to develop and maintain suitable financial tools and controls which work for how we work. And those are, these are constantly evolving. They, 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 you know, we, we come up with a, a slightly different tool probably every six months, which is because we have a, an evolving understanding of what matters to understand how the business is going and how we should be running it. Or perhaps it's Simon and Paul working with our communications team to ensure that our projects, once completed, are made visible, both through publications and awards programmes. That's a really important oxygen, I suppose, for the reputation of the practice and one of the means by which we ensure that we bring new work in, as I explained earlier. Or it might be Jonathan taking a more technical overview across all of our projects, whether through continuous improvements to our project procedures manual, seen here, across all of our projects, or overseeing the work of our head of sustainability and his team in carrying out sustainability, sustainability toolkit reviews at each of the RIBA work stages. Or managing the program of, of peer reviews, design reviews with an invited review panel at the earlier RIBA work stages. And indeed, a more close inspection by one or two peers at the technical work stages. And here the overall intention is to focus our resources and our intelligence in the ways which best support the quality of the work we produce. And so we hope sustain our ambition for our practice and see it continue to grow through developing itself rather than simply growing through numbers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Peter. Um, you, you might want to stop sharing the screen just so yeah. people don't want to uh, share their video or whatever uh, into each other. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I love seeing the youthful pictures of uh, you all with long, long locks in the yep, 80s. A long time ago. <laughs> um, uh, as I will abuse my uh, position and privilege of host to ask my question first. Um, you mentioned ambition to succeed early on, but what did success look for you like at that time and how did those goals change and why? Well, I think, I think, listen, I think that's really what the, the point I've tried to make throughout this presentation is that our, our goals when we set out have never really changed. And even though we've changed in scale and scope and capabilities of practice, um, our, our ultimate ambition remains, it, I, it always has always been the same, which is to, to do, to, to work with the most ambitious clients we can, Me, ambitious meaning um, they care about what they're doing, they want to do They want to do good work themselves, so to do that and to produce the best work we possibly can for them and to, and to challenge and, and push ourselves in doing so and, and hopefully therefore to make a difference uh, within the world of architecture and, and building and of course to the built environment, the cities that we all, we all live and work in. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've been very fortunate, but to a degree you make your luck as well, to have worked and continue to work with some amazing ambitious clients who, who deeply care about the quality of what they do. Increasingly, they care about the climate uh, that, that their buildings sit within and the changes to that climate. Um, and they work with us and allowed us to help them see new ways of making buildings that they, they'd assumed, you know, that there was only one pattern to, but we've been able to explore with them, almost like research and development across a range of projects to see to the extent to which we can push the boundaries of, of architecture as is understood. Uh, and and that that's that's always been our ambition. I think you know any architect who sets up in practice um, must share a similar kind of ambition. I would say. Uh, I'm going to read out Cameron's question. Who uh, and he asks, uh, 2021 is obviously a very different era to when you started. Looking at the architecture world today, how do you think you would change your method for growth? What's harder? What's easier? It's quite tough. I missed miss the beginning of that. 2021 is a different. Sorry, oh. it, I could, do you it's mind saying more time? It's a, uh, 2021 is a different era. Uh, to when you started. Uh, looking at the architecture world today, how would you change your method for growth? 
Well, I'd listen, that implies that there has been a method for growth. And I think mm. one of the things I, I hope I was reasonably clear about was that there was never a, they've never had a plan to grow. Um, the growth has, has, has been driven by, I suppose, um, completing projects successfully. Um, and I think there's a really important point here around the ability for architects to not just design, but to uh, get built their projects. And we've always <clears throat> we've always made it our mission to build what we design. Of course, it doesn't always happen, but it's always been our starting point. And by doing so and doing so successfully, in all with all the complexities that go with that, and London in particular is a, is a tough city to make buildings in financially, uh, in terms of uh, uh, planning and other constraints, infrastructure, and everything else that goes with it. But to achieve that, um, if you do achieve that and do it successfully, then, then that begins to form your success. And if you're busy finished, if you're busy, and, and architecture is a long game, right? So if you're busy seeing through existing projects and a new client or a new, or the same, an old client comes along and says, we'd like you to look at something else. You generally speaking, your ambition means you want to respond to that. You want to have another go. You want to have another chance at something little and, and, and the challenge that goes with it. So, so we, um, so we've tended to take up those opportunities and then and, and i guess you know essentially we've built on our success so we've gone along so i'm not sure necessarily maybe i haven't got what's behind the question exactly but i think you know our growth has happened because yeah. because it, it's, it's it's sort of because of the work we've done to, to make it happen i suppose um chris this question next and uh, he asks was there a moment that was a game changer in the development of your practice there, there, there are always moments and, and you know, they, they, they continue to happen to this day, I think, where, where usually, usually um, project related naturally enough. Um, and I suppose ones that come to mind in particular uh, for me would be, and I, I don't think I showed it actually, but we won a competition for a bus station in Walsall in 1995. Um, so we were only a six, seven year old practice at that point. Um, we'd entered it, it was an open competition, we'd entered it um, because we thought there might be a chance it might get built and ultimately it did, we, we managed to win it um, and we built it and it was important um, because I suppose for two reasons, one it kind of represented what we talk of as kind of everyday buildings that, that form cities or towns, um, so not necessarily the art galleries and we, we haven't done many art galleries but things like housing, offices and bus stations, so, so it was part of that picture. And it was also the fact that it drew a lot of attention to the practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we were invited to um, give a lecture at the RIBA in something that you, they used to call the Young Lions series at that time. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, we got to know some interesting people and that led to various clients and commissions and so on. So that was that was a particular key moment for the practice, I reckon. And I'm sorry, I should also say when we got shortlisted to the second stage of that with an honorarium, it allowed us to buy our first computers. So that was another reason why it was a milestone. Sounds Sign of the times. Um, Antonio asks, uh, what was your answer to potential clients before being a well-known practice when they asked you, what was your speciality? Well, I, again, I, I, I sort of touched on that, but, but I know I touched on a lot of things. So essentially, we, we would always go in, we would either try and invent um, uh, some kind of experience, visible experience in, in their field. But if we had none at all, then our key line would be to say, look, our expertise is architecture. We, we design, we're designers and we can bring that design potentially to any kind of building form. And, you know, we used to, for example, when it came to schools, we used to talk about how actually there's a lot of similarity between an efficient school plan and actually an efficient office plan. There are, you know, of course there are many differences as well, but as a school is a generally more um, cellular version of what an office might be. But essentially it would be about using experience we already had in other projects and showing how it might apply to it to this new project and I think you know unless you're getting to the most specialist end of design I might choose something like hospital design uh, where clearly there's a lot of information that you need to be aware of in order to be able to progress a project like that from scratch um, I think in, in many other areas you, you can develop um, you can apply your general architectural skills uh, and in a way by bringing that new perspective to a, to a client it can reap rewards I think. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a question from Alan who asks 80 to 85% of UK practices are under 10 employees with the remainder usually larger. The middle ground appears to be disappearing. Does technology today provide a better opportunity to set up to work on larger projects with fewer people? And is this the future of practice? Big question. Uh, it's a good question. I, 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 I don't know if it's a future practice. I think it's a perfectly uh, viable model though. And, and, I quite, mm. and I can quite easily see that that will be a growing um, 
trend. I, th I, th I think the difficulty, it, it does come back to um, that thing about reputation, ultimately. And, and so I, I am genuinely admiring of practices which stay much smaller than we have grown uh, and manage to do very, very substantial projects uh, of a massive scale. I think that that's, to be honest, that's not a trick we've pulled off, if you know what I mean. I suppose we could have tried to control our growth, but we chose not to because we, I think we were interested in the challenge of, of scale. Uh, uh, or became interested in, should I say. But I do think that is, a, you know, given the, the techniques and tools available, it is potentially uh, a possibility. And and if, if you don't, and obviously collaboration with other practices as well is an emerging thing. And we, we do a lot of collaboration, but it tends to be on by, by taking a master plan and splitting it out into different buildings and working with other practices less long established than us. But, but absolutely, you can also um, join forces as practices to get to, to see projects through. So I think that is definitely a future uh, probability. Yeah, in fact, the last CPD was about uh, joining forces. We had um, Dennis Austin of Dub Design. Um, we have a question from Richard who says, great presentation, Peter. My question is how you managed to handle the financial strains of a change in project scale, i.e. did you ever need to fund the practice to increase its robustness when dealing with larger fees and resource costs? Um, that is an interesting question. Um, we we uh we didn't know what we were doing for 10 years and we had no work and we ended up you know with a degree of debt not huge by today's standards but we ended up taking out a loan which we call the millennial loan so we aimed to pay it off by 2000 and and we managed to do that um and that allowed us from then on to have a clear view that we would never allow ourselves to significantly get into debt again um and we've more or less managed to do that um so that that's kind of context i suppose in response to that question i think um we, we, there's no doubt that with scale as i said earlier there are some there are some benefits around stability financial stability i mean providing you are well managed um and the ability to subsidize one project across another and there's no doubt that that, that happens an awful lot we continue i think it's you know the old what is the peter principle that 20% uh, of projects bring 80% of the profit is absolutely right. And indeed 80% of the projects therefore scratch away at 10, 20% of the projects. So that, you know, there's a lot, you can, you can tell a lot just from that fact. And it absolutely is true, I have to say, and it's always been, um, you know, a, an applicable statistic in our, in our experience. So yes, we, we, we subsidize, but we've never had to fork out of our own personal pockets because we tried to handle things more carefully than that. Sure. sure. Um, Risks asks, um, did your various studio spaces over the years limit the growth of the practice over time? Uh, they, they could have done, um, uh, uh, but we, we were lucky when we hit Moorlands because we, we were four people paying £2.50 a square foot when we first moved there, um, which was you know, crazy, crazily small amounts of money, even at that time. And we were rattling around in a very large space, but that allowed us both the financial room, but also the physical room to, to grow to about, 30 people I think or 25 people anyway and as I've already said Derwin bought our building and started refurbishing with our help so it came a, a natural moment where we took more space through them and of course we paid a lot more for it I think 10 times the amount of rent actually but it, you know it, we could afford it at that point um, and actually we've been very lucky that Moorlands as a, as a complex has allowed us to expand over time it's not always been easy there have been moments of crisis but we've essentially managed to do it until last year when ironically before COVID hit us all we uh, decided to take extra space in the white collar factory um, and indeed have taken extra space in the white collar factory but I suppose the interesting thing is what that's actually allowed us to do because we've had to review all of our spaces and we've had to space desks out and create wider corridors and all that kind of thing de-densify in other words is that whereas white collar factory had originally been taken that space in order to give us uh, room for, for growth if we needed it it's actually just allowing us to stay stable now but in, in a more spaced out less dense environment and so it's kind of uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird um, whatever unexpected outcome I suppose of the last 12 months. Sure. Um, I was going to ask you mentioned that each of you kind of took ownership of a project how did that uh, how did you kind of initiate that process and how did you know how was that decided what kind of uh, Went through process. Actually. Do you mean do you mean within the practice or within architectural projects? Um, both actually, really. But okay. uh, with, with the picture, really. 
Yeah, I, I uh, well, on architecture, I think it just used to, uh, you know, either it, it was who it originally, initially, it was who picked up the phone, actually, as simple as that, uh, uh, unless it was a kind of personal um, relationship with the, the future client, which was the case in one or two cases. But, you know, at the earliest stages, we tended to kind of all muck in together on most projects and somebody would probably lead it and others would help out. So there was it didn't seem particularly important to kind of uh, or there was no particular method for how we, we established who would do what. And of course, that evolved as people started to develop relationships with clients and they'd keep coming back. And so that would become stronger and harder. And so, so the idea of kind of studio started to emerge as a result of that um, in terms of aspects of the practice beyond projects. I mean, I've, I said a while ago that um, I'd always done a very amateurish job of looking at money and um, related things um, because I was happy to. Um, and it was a natural fit for me to continue to do that once I once once it became clear that uh, you know that that felt like a right move for the practice and for our for our ambitions for the practice doesn't mean I don't still get involved in architecture both directly in projects so the Barbican is one of my projects um, and, and there are a couple of other things as well but most of my time is spent on the practice but I do also review um, uh, projects at their various RIBA works stages when I will be part of the review panel so that there's kind of another route into it for me there. And Jonathan, you know, again, if it, I think it comes down to natural fit, partly about areas of interest, enthusiasms. Um, and Jonathan had a particular fi a, a affinity with actually the legal side of running projects, as well as uh, the appointments that go with that contractual side. I mean, and also with the technical and risk management side of them. That's just where it's fallen out. Well, I'm going to read oh, and Simon, Simon, Sorry, and Simon and Paul are good at getting out there and, and meeting people. So that, that helps their position as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read a question from Zonny, uh, Ronnie, sorry, um, who asks, uh, how did uh, you, how did one let go of your role as a designer in your practice, brackets, the day-to-day -day architecture stuff, and transition into a businessman? Was this hard to do? Is it still hard to do? Do you wish sometimes uh, you wish you had stayed as a smaller practice? So leaving that last one till the end, I think, uh, yes, it was hard to do. And I, I, it was, it was um, when it went, as I, you know, I, 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 when I applied to go on the Cranfield course, the, the guy who ran the course called me up and said, and because I, I said in my entry, I, I want to work out to be a managing partner and, to, and whilst also running projects. And he basically said, well, I don't think you can, if I'm honest with you. So, you know, I, I didn't believe him when he said that, but I went through the course and I became, became to believe but I grew to believe that it was the right thing to do. It was obviously a sacrifice for me and in a way remains one. Um, I do I do genuinely, uh, I know this is going to sound corny, but I do genuinely think about um, being responsible for kind of running the practice and the glue that holds it together is in itself a design project of its own. So I suppose I'd see myself as part of what I'm doing here is, is making sure that the practice is fit for what it wants to be and how it is evolving and how it's developing. So, so in that sense, as a kind of design, and I, I genuinely bring, I think, an architectural understanding to all sorts of aspects of what I do, from how I talk to people to how I use presentations to describe ideas to them, which might not be about architecture, to mm. obviously how I interact with reviews. So, so yeah, so it, it's it's sort of it's a difference, but it's one I've I'm sort of happily reconciled with. Do I wish we hadn't grown? as large as we have no because if we if we hadn't you know we, because we've got the history we've got it's a bit like saying would you like to be younger again and it's very difficult to turn back and say well no i'm going to throw away my history you know it is what it is now i'm not going to turn the clock back um let me read out a question from robert bird um with modest growth in the first two decades the third decade saw ahmm grow from 100 to 400 plus what were the leadership challenges uh, you faced and how did you bring younger generation with you um well listen I, I think i also said early on sorry to repeat myself that that um in many ways as as, as people who aren't trained in running a business or, or being a business you know you do make it up as you go along and i think so the leadership challenges were understanding what leadership means in a growing business and and how you are effective as a leader and how you in, introduce leadership within uh, different tiers within the practice. In other words, structure, what does all that look like? And I think we took quite a long time to get to grips with that. Um, and in fact, it was only halfway through our second decade, so 2004-ish, five-ish, where we introduced any kind of structure beyond the fact that there were partners then and everybody else. And you're either a qualified architect or an unqualified architect and maybe half a dozen support staff. So, so you know, there's been a, a, a significant 
um, learning curve in that, the last 15 years of both putting in place uh, visible and effective leadership, including ourselves, and also continuing to evolve it so that it continues to evolve with a rapidly growing practice or relatively rapidly growing practice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of it you can get away with for some time, but then there are moments where you realise, crikey, we've really got to sort that, whatever that is, to, to get to catch up with with our growth. So I think, we, you know, we, we've coped. We've definitely been, there have definitely been moments where we've been, we've put ourselves under pressure. I don't mean in terms of the work so much as... Um, um, you know the, the stresses and strains of of keeping it. It comes about the quality point, keeping the quality up on everything that you want that you you aim to do. Um, and um, I sometimes think you know we've got away with it rather than we've we've kind of um, achieved it through absolutely careful planning. But I think it's because we put so much focus and energy into it as well, and that's obviously part of my role. Thank you for that. I'm going to read a read a comment from Jack, who says, "Thank you for your presentation. It was very fascinating. It was really fascinating. What advice?" Oh, it's disappeared. Uh, pardon me. What advice would you give to those who want to follow with the same trajectory in creating their own practice with fellow students or colleagues? Well, I'd say that's a good question. Um, I think that's why I bothered to talk a bit about our early working together, which you know I almost didn't include, but it, it, it fundamental to the fact that actually almost 40 years since I met Jonathan this year and, and Simon and Paul met each other and 35 years since we for working together, we're still um, we're, we're friends still, but we're still as importantly we're still in business together. And one hears there's so many um, multi-headed practices where where you know they can run into problems, even if it's a couple of people. So the importance of being honest, transparent, clear with one another is is vital, especially around money. I have to say, in any partnership, that that's always really important. Um, but I think for us also, it was it, that 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 early model we we d- d- developed without knowing it uh, of a kind of way of working together, a way of sharing information, a way of debating, but at the same time giving each other responsibility to go and do things on our own. That that's fundamental to 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 where we are today. And I'm sorry, I forgot what the question was now, but I think I've, I think I've roughly answered it. Uh, yeah, it's just advice. Uh, who knows what so, 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 yeah, in other words, so be clear about, be very clear with each other, be very clear what your intentions and ambitions are as much as you can define them, be very clear on money. Uh, and, um, you know, that, 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 that clarity is the key. Transparency and clarity is the key between, between partners. Sure. Um, I'm going to read that question from Alan, who says, thank you for the insights on running a large practice. Could you say something on where PI is going for everyone? And I presume they mean professional indemnity. Um, is there any alternative to the huge increases in premiums uh, we are all seeing? I don't think what your premium is, but probably as much as GDP on some small countries. It is substantial. Uh, listen, I'm not, I, to be honest, I'm not the best placed person to talk about this. So whether I answer that, whether I'm able to answer the, uh, the, the I'll answer the question fully. I, I don't really know. It is it is shocking how it's gone up in the last couple of years. I suppose uh, post Grenfell in particular. Um, we, we're a mem- we're a member of the REN, which is a mutual insurance company. So all of the members essentially put their premiums into a bucket, and that money is then used to deal with any claims that come out of it. So it's incumbent on us all. It's like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a it's a big collaboration, if you like. I'm sure you all know what a mutual is, uh, and it relies on trust in your in your fellow insurees if that's a word those being insured to to operate their practices in the best possible way to, to minimize the risks to, to have in place proper quality control and and i i think it's an amazing model because um it's a sort of self-supporting one it's a self-policing one um and of course you know you could you get some rogue practices coming into it but but the ren as a, as a body try very hard to kind of avoid that and, and take references before accepting anybody in that, that so i'm not saying that because i'm smug about it because we've still got a very high insurance premium but my point is as a model it seems to me about as benign a model as you could expect for any form of insurance one where you're actually covering your own um, position along with others um, and at the same time kind of um, re- de- requiring people to act properly and, and and perform in a professional manner as for what comes next and how we you know how we get out of this loop listen it's got to, it's got to come back to all the things that i know the rba in particular is working away on which is about um which is about um reviewing the building regulations it's about how we ensure proper lines of continuity for, of responsibility within project projects and that's obviously a complex landscape in particular with the, the design and build work world where where you know you are ha- handing the baton on down the chain and that's in the context of kind of poorly 
poorly written or, or out of date and certainly um, building regulations which are able to be gained quite easily, it, it's, it is a recipe for disaster. So the sooner we get some of those things put in place, um, the more likely it is that, that, that insurers will take a, 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 you know, a slight sign and things will start to improve again. But I, I'm afraid, you know, the risk is the risk is the risk. And, and if, that, if, that's, if that's what where premiums are going at a moment in time, it's very difficult to see a way around it. And I recognise for smaller practices, it can be an absolute shocking disaster and, and an impossible, um, impossible situation to be in. And I, I, I wish I could give you some better answer on that. Thank you for that anyway. Um, I was going to ask, um, how much time did you dedicate to exposure over kind of purely procuring new work? maybe perhaps in the early stages as well. I know you mentioned that you, you hired a photographer early on and that was quite a big thing. Um, well, I think we've listened at first, it was always a simple formula. Uh, yeah. As soon as you get an opportunity, A, make the most of it as a piece of design, try and find something in it that, that nobody else was expecting or could see, uh, build it, because that means you can it's real, then you can photograph it and then you can talk to people about it, whether it's the press or whether it's awards committees or whether it's potential clients. So that, that you know, in simple terms, that, that's always been our approach. And, and uh, I mentioned photography because it is, you know, it has always been something we've invested in. It's an expensive part of, 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 of showing what you do potentially but it's an important part of, of showing that you've actually achieved something and gives you that as, as you know that 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 kind of coll the collateral to be able to explain to other people what you could do for them so i suppose it's always been an important part of you know that that's that little kind of loop i showed at halfway through the presentation it's that thing about you know the flow of current projects leading to a flow of future projects and and it's it's fundamental um and we've taken different roles and different levels of um responsibility i suppose for how that happens simon and paul i said earlier very good at particularly good i should say at getting out there and meeting people and that's been really important um jonathan and i less so um but that's just in our natures i think mm -hmm. um when you produced that diagram how did you ensure that that was then adopted by the whole practice was that something that was it a whole presentation was it something that's filtered down uh, no listen the diagram could be applied to pretty much any um, service or products anywhere so it's actually not particularly unique to architecture certainly not unique sure. to us um, and all it was really was me um, identifying this this virtuous circle and, and 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 underlining the importance therefore which we already knew of course of you know, the, the importance of sustaining quality in what you do because by sustaining the quality in every project you 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 develop produce build you're more likely to get the, the next the next project is, is more likely to be a better a better opportunity or a different opportunity or something else to build on and, and so on and so forth so it's about that kind of con continually trying to stretch yourself improve yourself um, move on to the next interesting challenging thing um, so in it in, because because you know we love architecture don't we architects we love doing what we do we, we we enjoy it deeply and we love the challenge of new projects so it's it's part of that picture um, if anyone else has any other questions, now is the time to, to do it. I can see we've got about seven more minutes left, although, you know, there's no more to ask. Oh, here we are from Cameron, who asks, how has the movement of media to social and online changed the virtuous cycle of projects? Is it harder to get good, good exposure? Uh, I'm afraid, um, surprise, surprise, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, a close user of social media myself, uh, but we do as a practice, of course. And I, I, um, I can't see how it could do anything really other than um, increase exposure to projects. But of course, that can be a negative and a positive. Um, you know, social media is is obviously more democratic in that sense, less controlled by individual or uh, institutions or whatever, uh, and certainly not by us. So we we can put out whatever we want, but ultimately people will make of it what they will. So I think. Um, uh, in the end, architecture is, you know, it speaks for itself, I suppose, is my point, both in terms of um, how it appears and how it can be used and how it feels to be inside, how well built it is and, and, and so on and so forth. So so I think, um, and that, that's one of the things, I suppose, that, that, that differentiates architecture from, you know, other professions in, in many ways. There is a visible outcome from it, which is able to be shared and commented on. And so, of course, you know, so I think social media can only support that uh, as to whether it becomes a virtuous circle or a vicious one depends on what, what your architecture is i suppose mm. um reese and robert are asking more or less the exact same question and uh, now that you're established what's next 
uh, for OHMM in the next 10 years? Well, listen, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the move to employee ownership was part of a bigger idea about the four of us, principally the four of us, the founders, and, and you know, at some point knowing that we would want to uh, pull back from, from let's say, full-time work. And, and this is, you know, we're, we're all in our upper 50s now, he said, actually very late 50s. So we've got a few years to go. But, but nonetheless, we, 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 when, we, when we moved to employee ownership, it was partly about thinking about the longer term and about trying to set the practice for which, you know, which, we, which we had allowed to grow and which, which, for which we had a huge responsibility, to set it up such that it could continue to be successful in the future. That, that, that was the idea. And we've, you know, one is aware of other practices, often multi-headed ones, but not always, where where the, the succession hasn't been planned for. And, and let me be clear, we aren't start, we haven't started actually planning our succession yet. But what we have done is put in place the conditions, the environment by which we think we're going to be able to do that. And principally, that's about dealing with the ownership of the business. So in about five or six or seven years' time, we will no longer be direct owners of the business because we will have. Um, either sold or passed on all of our shares to the employee ownership trust so ownership's dealt with um, and actually um, ownership is then uh, everybody's uh, and those who are invested in the in the, in, in the practice at a moment in time who are employed by the practice at a moment in time have that have that involvement in its ownership so it's about kind of giving the founders um, the ability at the right time for them as individuals to move on or slow down or whatever and it's also about setting up the practice for the longer term so that it can continue to be a force for a force for well hopefully a force for good within architecture thank you, thank you. Um, another question from Alan who asks, do you, do you see your teams returning to office working once we're out of the situation or will there be a more balanced split of office and home work? Great question. Well, listen, I, I think it will be more balanced. It's bound to be. Um, none of us um, expected what came. None of us knew if we'd all, all be able to cope with, in our case, 500 people suddenly all working from home overnight. And we were, we were lucky in that we'd started our trials, you know, the week or two before that. So we'd begun to test the technology, but anyway, we are where we are. And there's no doubt that there are um, some benefits, huge benefits actually to flexible working generally. And there are actually huge benefits, I think, especially to younger architects, to being able to get involved in our, in our practice in particular, involved in the kind of meetings that they might not otherwise be able to be. Because, you know, you can only have so many people in a room when it's a physical meeting, whereas through this kind of medium, you can have, as many people as you want, listening, observing, sitting in the background. So hearing firsthand how a client presentation goes, what the feedback is, what the, what the feeling about the design is. So some huge benefits from that, along with flexible working. But we firmly believe, and we shared this with our, uh, with, with everybody in our office, that we are, a, you know, we're clearly a, a business that, that collaborates, that is a creative business. And we think that we work best when we work together. Uh, physically together, especially when it comes to the, the earlier stages of design. Of course, there are moments in any project where you can sit at a computer for most of your day, getting on with some pretty serious, um, you know, drawings or whatever, whatever. But, but there is an, a very important aspect to the collaborative process, which is about being uh, available to one another, whether that's uh, the, the, the ease of the conversation, the fluidity of it, or indeed the mentoring uh, possibilities of having, you know, different levels of seniority working together and sharing with each other. So I think there are lots of reasons why we will want people to get back into the office. But of course, we will also um, have a much more flexible approach to to how people do uh, where they spend their time working within within limits, you know. Mm, thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question and I'll read out one is and uh, they ask, uh, why did you um, not try to set up another satellite office beyond Oklahoma? Uh, well, OK, so Oklahoma was definitely a moment in time and a kind of opportunity which was born out of um, literally born out of uh, one guy in our office who happened to be from Oklahoma who said, I know, you know, I know some people out there. It might be worth me going out and seeing what I can make happen at this difficult moment. Um, you know, we've done we've done versions of that. Uh, so our Bristol office, which I know is not a satellite outside the UK, was set up because somebody said, I, I've, I've decided I'm going to move west. We've got a young family. And we said, why don't we see if we can make remote working work for a bit? This is about 15 years ago. And that's now an office of 60 people because, you know, people want to work in places like Bristol. But it's very much a kind of addendum to the London office. It's not, it's not although it is doing its own work regionally, it's not, it's not designed as a regional office, whereas Oklahoma clearly is about being founded in Oklahoma and working in that context. So we, we would never rule 
we never we've never we've never ruled anything out we're opportunists right and i think architects are uh, in, in, you know hopefully a good opportunist in that sense and if we saw an opportunity but it would be around people it would be around somebody who worked for hmm or it would be around a client who said i want to work with you in this place that might lead to us deciding to set up um, offices elsewhere so we never say no in that sense but equally what we don't do is kind of go and plant our flag in sydney and say this is hmm come and come and give us work that that isn't our style either Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, and that kind of rounds us off nicely at 2 p.m. Um, so I say thank you so much for your time, Peter. It's been uh, great to hear you speak. And thank you for preparing um, the slides and the presentation as well. No thank problem you. at all. Thanks uh, for inviting thank me. Pleasure. And thank you to everyone else who uh, came in attendance as well. It's fantastic to have a large audience. Um, such a pleasure to have you all. And thank you for all your questions as well. Yeah, thank um, you.